Herschel Hobbs, his contributions to the Southern Baptist Convention have been well documented. He served as the Baptist Hour radio preacher for 18 years from 58 to 1976. And he also served as the president of the convention from 61 to 63. And he also chaired the Baptist Faith and Message Committee. And he's published around 160 books. A hundred of these are Sunday school commentaries on the Bible called Studying Adult Life and Work Lessons. He published these from 1968 to 1993. He also wrote numerous articles for Baptist State Papers and other popular publications. Uh, all of Hobbes' writings contain a grassroots theology amenable to the average Baptist layperson. As David Dockery has noted, Hobbes' theological writings develop out of sermons delivered to his congregation. Leon Macbeth listed Hobbes as one of a few pastor theologians who had greatly influenced Southern Baptists. Walter Sheridan has also named him as one of Southern Baptist's most influential theologians of the 20th century. In fact, Mullins, uh, or uh, Sheridan, added that while E.Y. Mullins served as Southern Baptist theologian in the first half of the 20th century, Hobbes served in that same role in the second half of the 20th century. James Leo Garrett, in his recent monumental study of Baptists <laughs> says that Hobbes is one of two influential Southern Baptist pastor theologians of the 20th century and the other he names is W.A. Criswell who is Hobbes who was one of Hobbes' good friends. Uh, Hobbes is worthy of study uh, but what I would like to do is to look at some recent interpretations of Hobbes by Southern Baptist leaders and <laughs> try to unmask Hobbes by looking at how he has been interpreted by various Southern Baptists in the uh, in recent years. The first thing I want to look at is Hobbes as the kingmaker. Uh, one of the earliest significant evaluations of Hobbes appeared in the late 1980s and was documented by James Hefley. Uh, Hefley claimed that Hobbes was one of the key players among a well-intentioned group of kingmakers who sought to thwart the efforts of activist con conservatives in the early 1960s. Uh, Hobbes, according to Hefley, was a leader of a political machine that tried to keep a conservative activist uh, at bay. Uh, Hefley mentions uh, a, a classroom a conversation that C.R. Daly had at Southern Seminary in which C.R. Daly said that Hobbes was involved in this political machine. He also mentions Mark Coppinger's letters. Uh, Coppinger supposedly went to the archives at Oklahoma Baptist University and discovered the, the, smoking, the smoking gun. It's a group of letters that Hobbes and uh, uh, Carl Bates and others had written uh, to each other about nominating Hobbes for the president of the convention in the early 1960s. And for Coppinger this was proof of a political machine. Uh, by the way, those who want to call this a good old boy network uh, should, should also know that Marie Mathis was involved in this nomination process of Hobbes. So there was at least one woman, and she was the uh, head of the WU at the time. So there was at least one woman involved in the good old boy network. <laughs> uh, but ten years after uh, Hefley's claims, uh, Jerry Sutton in his book, The Baptist Reformation, uh, also repeated Hefley's assertion concerning the presence of a good old boy network of kingmakers uh, designed to protect in what uh, Sutton said was to, to protect an unhealthy theological diversity in the SBC. Now Dennis Wiles, who is the pastor at First Baptist Arlington, had an interview in 1990 with uh, Hobbes. And he asked Hobbes about Hefley's description. 
And Hobbes disagreed strongly with the notion that he led a well-organized political machine whose primary object objective was to thwart the activity of disaffected conservatives by controlling who would be the uh, SBC president. Hobbes remarked, in fact, quote, I'm not going to use the words in my mind. That is not true. They are taking things out of context, twisting them to better justify a political machine, and there is no comparison." End quote. Now, Hobbes went on to describe an informal, unstructured association of conservative and moderate pastors who would at times confer about whom to nominate for president. Well, the presence of a loosely structured group of key leaders who regularly developed a consensus about whom to support for election is hardly surprising. Although the so-called good old boy network negatively critiqued not only by Huff, Hefley and Sutton, but also by Ralph Elliott and Morris Ashcraft, uh, this group supported both conservatives and moderates. And Hobbes uh, critiqued the, the the new good old boy network as uh, only uh, supporting conservatives and excluding moderates. As for Hobbes's role in the network, uh, Hefley's depiction of Hobbes as the protector of theological heresy is misguided. James Leo Garrett and Bill Leonard have provided more balanced evaluations of Hobbes' political activities. Uh, Garrett, who just presented the Gaskin Lectures at Oklahoma Baptist University in 2011, emphasized Hobbes' quote, build, uh, bridge building posture, end quote. Now one might not like the politics of Hobbes, but he repeatedly sought to build bridges between varied groups within the convention. He sought to construct a bridge between Ralph Elliott and the Midwestern trustees, although it might have been a misguided bridge. Uh, he didn't fully construct it either, did he? Uh, he sought to formulate a confession amenable to most Southern Baptists. He sought to convince the convention not to ban volume one of the Broadman Commentary. And as a member of the Peace Committee, he sought to play the part of mediator, again, unsuccessfully. Now, Bill Leonard highlighted Hobbes' role as conciliator as well, noting that Hobbes, like Mullins, quote, mastered the art of denominational compromise, affirming conservative theology while refusing to define that theology so narrowly as to exclude large segments of the constituency or precipitate schism. I had a personal interview with Hobbes in 1994 in his home. I drove from Waco to Oklahoma City to spend uh, an afternoon with him. And I was reading to Hobbes various statements about uh, people who had described him. And I read a Bill Leonard's statement to Hobbes, and he uh, sitting on his sofa, leaned back and said, you can sign my name by that statement. So he was uh, fully in uh, agreement with Leonard's evaluation of him. Well, when you look at Hobbes's bridge building posture, or his role as the master of denominational compromise, it makes sense when you read Cecil Sherman's statement that Hobbes' role on the, on the Peace Committee, Cecil lamented, that he was supposed to be a moderate but often sided with fundamentalists. But that makes sense given the denominational context of the time. Alright, the second uh, event that I would like to look at regarding Hobbes is Hobbes and the Calvinists. Uh, Hobbes was again scrutinized in the 1990s by a group of scholars who emerged during the 1980s affirming a new Dorsian Calvinistic views and spearheading a resurgence of Calvinism in the SBC. Uh, these scholars, Timothy George, David Dockery, Tom Nettles, and Tom Askell, all associated to some degree with Founders Ministries. They promoted the thesis that the normative theological outlook for Southern Baptists is Dorsian Calvinistic theology that sustained Southern Baptists during their first two generations, 
was what was altered considerably during the 20th century. According to Dockery, influenced by the modified Calvinism of E.Y. Mullins, W.T. Connor, Calvinism began to taper among Southern Baptists. Nettles attributed this mild doctrinal shift to the influence of Mullins and L.R. Scarborough. In a 1993 address, Dockery, however, blamed a trio of theologians in the last half of the 20th century, Dale Moody, Frank Stagg, and Herschel Hobbes, along with influential pastors such as Wayne Dehoney, uh, for altering severely the uh, historic theological commitments of the SBC by converting Southern Baptists from uh, Calvinism to an Arminian view of atonement, election, and predestination. In 2001, Dockery wrote, quote, led by the thought of Herschel Hobbes, Southern Baptists in the middle and later years of the 20th century move toward a modified understanding of salvation." End quote. Uh, for Dockery, Hobbes' view on justification had more in common with the general Baptists of the 17th century than with Boyce, Mullins, and even Connor. Nettles, although noting the considerable influence of Moody, the Arminian, and Dehoney, and Hobbes, the semi-Arminians, did not lay sole responsibility for this doctrinal shift at their feet. Nettles did warn, however, that these, what he calls severe theological alterations, could be considered, quote, theological apostasy, end quote. In fact, Nettles said that these theological developments have not contributed to the health of the denomination, but have rather spawned a climate of theological disunity, rampant absenteeism, a circus mentality in much of evangelism, and a justified distress concerning the spirituality of professing Christians. Now, we've all seen all that, especially the circus mentality and the evangelism. But do we want to lay that at the feet of the semi-Arminians and the Arminians? That's the, that's the question. Uh, uh, apparently for Net Nettles, though, there could be no Calvin and Hobbes in the SBC. <laughs> this, uh, this is not the case for Dockery and Timothy George, however. Uh, in 1997, Timothy George, who rejoiced in the increasing awareness of Reformed theology among Southern Baptists, claimed Hobbes for the new SBC. In his Baptist Why and Why Not Revisited, a self-identified Baptist manifesto for the 21st century, edited by George and his wife Denise, the list of contributors of this book reads like a who's who of the new SBC. But a picture of Hobbes, who had died two years earlier, appears on the dust jacket cover of the book. And Hobbes wrote the first chapter in which he defended the doctrine of biblical inerrancy uh, while also affirming for Southern Baptists either the plenary or dynamic theories of biblical inspiration. Uh, in the book's next chapter, uh, entitled The Future of Southern Baptist Theology, which George wrote, he cautioned Reformed Southern Baptists that as they called upon their fellow Baptist brothers and sisters to return to the rock from which they were hewn, which he identified as an Orthodox Baptist consensus, he claimed that had developed by the mid-19th century and began to erode by the early 20th century, uh, he said that we must learn to live in gracious equipoise with some who don't ring all five bells quite the same way we do. <laughs> Yet Hobbes only rang one of those Dorsian Calvinistic bells. <laughs> but for George, one bell is enough because Hobbes asserted many other elements of George's theological consensus. Likewise, Dockery, who, studied, uh, Hobbes, who has studied Hobbes carefully and has written about him in some detail, consistently demonstrates great respect and appreciation for Hobbes, although critical of Hobbes for his non-Calvinistic understanding of justification, his overemphasis on individual experience, his insufficient comprehension of doctrinal confessions, 
and for not emphasizing his commitment to biblical inerrancy more explicitly during the controversy years. Uh, he expresses appreciation for him despite these criticisms. Uh, Dockery might not care for Hobbes' semi-Arminianism, but in the end he accepts him due to his theologically conservative outlook. As Dockery has explained recently, Hobbes was a thoroughgoing biblicist and would not have been one of those trying to lead Southern Baptists to become another liberal mainline denomination. Now, the, the notion that Calvinism is normative theology for Southern Baptists and that Hobbes played a role in moving Southern Baptists away from that position, that, that demands an exhaustive evaluation. I, I don't want to take the time because I don't have it, <laughs> uh, to, to get into that discussion, although I did write some uh, things about that in the paper. Um, I, I do have some critiques of that. Maybe during the question and answer time we can get into that. Uh, I, I, I do not think that Hobbes has uh, altered severely Southern Baptist theological commitments, however. I think he has reached back and has grabbed a hold of a strand that has existed, uh, and I think I can demonstrate that. All right, the, the final event that I want to look at is uh, in 2000, Hobbes uh, came under scrutiny again. Uh, a group of Texas Baptists, uh, they uh, were uh, a committee, uh, it was a 16-member committee formed by the, the BGCT, uh, they were discussing how they could look, look at and examine uh, funding uh, for theological education. And so in September of 2000, the 16-member committee uh, uh, shared its findings. And the committee reported that in recent visits with Southern Baptist Seminary Presidents uh, Kelly, Moeller, Hemphill, uh, that the, the presidents referred to the 1963 BF&M as a neo-orthodox document. Uh, also, one of the presidents supposedly said that the closest thing that the 63 committee had to a professional theologian was Herschel Hobbes, and Hobbes was duped. Uh, the presidents maintained that there were unidentified neo-orthodox individuals that heavily influenced the 63 document. Now, this uh, charge of neo-orthodoxy in the 63 uh, BF&M actually came from Paige Patterson. Uh, in, uh, in these interviews that uh, Dennis Wiles had with uh, Hobbes, he also had an interview with Patterson, in which Patterson uh, calls the 63 BF&M neo-orthodox in several areas. Now, here's what uh, Wiles said, uh, or Hobbes said to Wiles when uh, Hobbes, uh, Wiles asked Hobbes about whether there's neo-orthodoxy in the 63 uh, statements uh, concerning scripture. Uh, Hobbes replied, that came from Paige Patterson. I'd say Paige doesn't know what he's talking about. In other words, I'll stand till Gabriel blows my horn on that statement. Any interpretation in the Bible that does not agree with the revelation of God in Christ is the wrong interpretation. Jesus is the final, full, complete revelation of God. And if Paige denies that, then I'll call him a liberal or bordering on liberalism. So I think there's nothing to pick at. I'll stand for that statement. And that was Hobbes. Now, in, in, in 2006, time out, okay. In 2006, when Garth Pivas died, uh, Baptist Press interviewed several Southern Baptist theologians who um, reframed the discussion. And basically they retreated from this assertion that there's neo-orthodoxy in the statements on scripture in the 63 BF&M and said that, well, it just opened up the door to neo-orthodox interpretations. Uh, so they backed away from Hobbes. Uh, so in the end, Hobbes has been, um, he's been renounced and at other times claimed by leaders of the SBC. Uh, the SBC the leaders haven't quite known what to do with him. Uh, but uh, he, he seems to be uh, a, a person that uh, has, has, a, has a, a mixed legacy uh, in the SBC at this point. Okay.
Jerry, it uh, seems to me that we are in danger of losing Hobbs in the next decade or 20 years. Do you think that that's correct? And why would we, if that is correct, why would we be more prone to lose Hobbs than we would, say, Mullins? Yeah, well, uh, when, when uh, Garrett delivered the Gaskin lectures, he noted that uh, Hobbs is not being mentioned in CBF circles at all anymore. And he, had, you know, Mullins is the, the theologian of the CBF. And in the SBC, he has sort of this, this mixed legacy. So I think, yes, we are, we are in danger of losing him. Uh, I think because of his uh, compromising nature in an increasingly uncompromising world, uh, that we're in danger of losing his, uh, the, the processes by which he worked, as well as, as his theological moderation. Do you think it's um, the, the criticism that Eliot had so fiercely against him for his, what he called double speak or whatever, do you think that plays a role in why the CBF hasn't embraced Hobbes? Um, is that fair? I, I think it's because my opinion is that the, the CBF would rather have a theologian as a theologian rather than a pastor theologian.